Many of you have actually asked us to develop a reinforcement learning course. Um, so we did that. And uh, in this set of courses or lectures, I'm going to be talking about, uh, you know, the following. So defining the key features of a reinforcement learning problem, uh, knowing when to use reinforcement learning, because it's, you know, whether we, we like it or not, it's not the solution to all possible problems. Uh, choose the right category of RL algorithms, understand what are value functions. And also towards the end of the course, we are going to be doing like um, uh, some coding exercises uh, where we use the standard RL algorithms in Python and also understand the gym environment. Uh, so those slides have been worked on with uh, Matthew Zimmer, who will also hopefully join us later on to give maybe some of the parts about the coding exercises. So. In the plan of this overall course, we'll cover the following, right? So we'll have an introduction, and then we will have a definition of what a Markov decision process is. Then we're going to talk about value functions, how to solve them using dynamic programming. Then we're going to go model free. And now we're going to talk about how to explore or how to exploit this exploration exploitation trade off. And then we're going to talk about solution methods, actor-only methods, critic-only methods, and actor-critic methods. And then we go to the coding exercises. So in this first lecture, we're going to be talking about Markov decision processes. And then in the second lecture, we're going to be talking about value functions and so forth. Right. So let's just start a bit about what is reinforcement learning, right? So uh, broadly speaking, machine learning could be split into three uh, subcategories. Uh, the first one is supervised learning, where you actually have labeled data. So I will give you the input X and the and I will give you the corresponding output Y. So this is an example of a classifier, right? So where I give you, you have two features of your input X1, X2, and then you have two classes, these round uh, um, circles and the Xs. And your goal is to find this separation margin between them. So in supervised learning, right, um, <clears throat> The, the, what, what you're actually really doing is uh, uh, trying to uh, kind of, uh, you know, I give you this labeled data and you try to find this relation from the input to the output. The second field in machine learning is called uh, unsupervised learning, and that is mostly where you learn from unlabeled data. So I give you your data points and I don't tell you to which class or what's their Y value. I just give you a set of inputs X. And then I ask you to find for me patterns in this data, or you can cluster them and so on. Now, you can still differentiate things like self-supervised learning, which people might think it's on the intersection maybe between supervised and unsupervised learning. However, self-supervised learning is also, from my point of view, a form of unsupervised learning um, uh, that, you know, that, that has been gaining a lot of attention. Um, and the third uh, direction in machine learning, or the third category in machine learning, which is what we are going to discuss and talk about in this lecture, in this set of lectures, is going to be the reinforcement learning. So the reinforcement learning here, the idea is maybe it's the most uh, complex of all the machine learning fields. And I'm not saying that because I work in reinforcement learning, but because in reinforcement learning, you actually have an agent that is acting in an environment and the agent will take an action and the environment will respond by a transition and a reward. We're gonna define what we mean by all those in a second, but what is really happening is uh, the agent uh, itself is collecting its data from the environment via a policy or an action selection rule. So it's not like you're given a set of data set, but the agent kind of tries to accumulate its data as it interacts with the environment. And now its goal is to find that best sort of trajectories in that environment to maximize its reward signal. Of course, there are other fields in reinforcement learning, such as things called offline RL, where you have a pre-given data set that has been collected upfront for you. But in the general framework of reinforcement learning, uh, you're going to learn from data you collect from the environment, and you're going to learn so as to maximize some notion of rewards in that environment. So these are the three flavors of machine learning or AI. The supervised case where I give you X and its corresponding label Y, was it a class or a real number if we were talking about regression or a class if we're talking about classification. Or I give you a set of unsupervised data where I just give you the input points and I tell you find for me patterns. So think about clustering, dimensionality reduction, things like that. 
intensity estimation, or even maybe self-supervised learning. And then, of course, there's this field, which, which is the, the interest in, in this lecture, uh, where we're going to be having an agent that is interacting with an environment in a real world. It takes an action in that environment. The environment transitions, and you get a state and reward, and your goal is to learn to maximize your overall discounted rewards. So um, so here's kind of the interaction loop, right, that the agent will take. So at each step, the agent observes the current state of the environment, so where it is in that environment, and then it will decide to execute an action. So it will say, okay, uh, move my joints in this way or, you know, move me there or something like that. And then the environment would respond by a change in its state and a reward for how good that action was. So to illustrate this, right, imagine I'm an agent, like a robot, living in a room, and my goal is to, you know, go to the door in that room. So my state would be, for example, my position in my room, that's my current state, let's say, and then I decide to execute an action, for example, to move myself a step forward or backward or left or right or to a certain angle, for example. And then to that, the environment changes. So I go to a new state in that environment, to new x prime, y prime, for example, in my room. And then I will get a reward signal telling me how good my transition was. So for instance, if I'm getting closer to the goal, I'll be happy and I'll get a positive signal. If I'm going far away from the door, then I will get a negative signal, right? So of course, this is just an example. Not all problems are like that. But the idea is that this is a concept of what an agent is, what an environment, an action, and a reward, and a transition. Now, in terms of the terminology, we're going to use something called a policy or an actor. So the policy is what will take actions in the environment. So I that's what will tell me what action I will take if I'm at a certain state. The value function will tell me how good my actions are uh, in uh, it is counted to the future way. So it will tell me how good I am uh, by taking that action, not only instantaneously, but also towards a long horizon of the future steps. We also call that a critic. And we also have a model or a transition model that would actually tell me how the environment will transition from a state action to a successor state. And there are many examples of reinforcement learning tasks that you can look into in literature. Things are like Acrobat, uh, which is kind of this system, or a Cartel system, or a half cheetah environment, a humanoid. These are different types of agents. They, they have different types of actions. Uh, and from there, you know, you can uh, build your policy, uh, which will take the actions, you know, to, for example, balance the pole in a top right position, uh, have the cheetah running forward, or maybe have the humanoid running forward, for example. So those are some examples. Of course, the setup is much broader than this. You know, it involves many other things, Atari games and so on, uh, but recently also have been applied to large language models. So, okay, so here's an example, right? So this is a half sheeta robot, right? So this is a half sheeta robot. And this sheeta robot, you know, it's like supposed to learn, you know, kind of how to run forward, right? So this is the half sheeta robot, and it's trying to learn, you know, how I'm going to run forward as fast as I can. So this is my dynamical system. In this system, I can apply actions. So those actions could be, for example, torques, you know, to each of those joints of this shita. The states would be uh, how those uh, uh, joints have actually changed over time upon me applying that action. And then, of course, you see here, the thing that is deciding to apply the action is what we call the policy. And that policy is applying those actions to every joint in that uh, uh, half cheetah. And it is getting the state, so it's conditioned on the state. So it's getting the state um, depending on the position you know, of the joints. How did the joints vary? in that environment. Of course, this is not a good policy, you know, because the cheetah is just uh, um, falling down, it's not running, uh, but it, I think it's just a random policy that is executing the actions, i.e. Uh, the torques on those joints and getting back the states. And examples, <clears throat> uh, uh, so, so, so this is kind of uh, uh, the goal, right, is to in fact go from, you know, some behavior that kind of looks like this, right, into a 
policy, right, which actually makes the cheetah run like this, right? So the goal is we're going to start uh, from a random uh, policy, and then uh, with that, we try to improve it such that the cheetah will decide to, you know, or will learn how to run forward like this. So what we typically do is we typically define a policy in DeepRL. We define a policy which is a neural network that is taking the state as an input and giving you an action as an output. So the policy will give you an action conditioned on the state of the environment. So um, the action A, T, that the policy will take is actually sampled because typically we will get a distribution here, uh, but let's talk about this in a second. However, it's actually going to come from a neural network, you know, which is parameterized by some unknown weights, right, with some unknown weights, um, uh, conditioned uh, on the state ST, so knowing your state ST, you are trying to take an action A, T. And this state ST is nothing but, you know, the position of these joints and this action AT that is being emitted is nothing but the torques that I would be applying, right, on these different joints of this half cheetah, okay? Um, so that's kind of what the policy does, right? Like it takes the input, this current state, and then it'll give you an output, which is an action. Now, please notice that, of course, not all problems are written in this way. There are some problems which we call partially observable problems, and those partially observable problems, they will not only take a state, they will actually take a history of the state. But for now, let's just focus on the simplest case. So now the goal is we are going to, uh, we are going to uh, define this policy, uh, which takes a neural network, it's like a neural network taking state input, giving me action output. And then my goal is to find the weights of this policy to maximize my total discounted reward signal. So here I give you an example of the reward, right? Where I tell you the reward is minus 1,000, so very high negative reward if, you know, I kind of fell down or, you know, crashed or something. And otherwise you get some values like this, which is depending on the velocity divided by a constant minus the norm of the action that you have applied. So, so what does this reward say? Well, if I am running, so if I have a uh, uh, some velocity on one of the joints, this is x dot four, I think one of these, one, two, three, four, one of them actually, um, then then you will be getting positive signal, and you're also penalized if your magnitude of the action is very high, so to say. So, we want to run forward, but also we don't want to apply huge actions. Now, uh, the reward itself will depend on the task that, that is at hand, and that's is something we need to discuss later on. But I just want to show you here that the, the overall uh, concept of a reinforcement learning I agent is something that you have a dynamical system you would like to control. And then what you need to do is you want to be able to apply actions to the states where we parameterize that by something called a policy that will give me the action condition on the state, and my goal is to find that policy to maximize my total discounted rewards, where a reward is something like this, dictating the goal of the task at hand. Right, so, so now, so now <clears throat> maybe something you can do and tell us in the comments below, so what do you think is a state and an action, you know, that we can use for this type of game if we want to control the car. Or what about the Montezuma's revenge game? What could be a state and an action if we want this dude here uh, to actually jump down the ladder, uh, jump, jump down the ladder, jump above the skull, get the key and come back? Or what about in the robotics scenario, right? What could a state and an action be uh, for a, uh, for example, a Baxter robot here that is trying, you know, to, for example, grab a, a specific box and move it around, right? So what do you think states and actions of those could be? What are some, some states and actions that you could use in order to parameterize, you know, a reinforcement learning? A policy or define a reinforcement learning problem. Uh, so, for example, maybe here 
you can think about the picture, you know, the image to be the state. Maybe here you can think about, uh, you know, something about the car, its position, its orientation, and so on. Maybe here you can think about something, uh, you know, related to the position of the end effector or something like that, right? So, so what do you think? I mean, uh, there are some states and actions and rewards maybe for these environments. Do give, you know, write us in the comments below. We'll be happy to, you know, discuss with you if that could be a good state or not. But upon defining your state and upon defining an action, right? So here the state maybe is the car, uh, the action is where you want the car to go next, you know? Upon doing that, right? And defining the state and the action and the reward, for example, don't crash and, you know, uh, run as, as, as much as you can. Now you will need to learn a policy that will actually maximize this total expected return which is the reward function or the sum of the rewards that you got. Okay. <clears throat> so we have kind of understood what RL is trying to solve, right? So there is an environment, there's an agent, the agent decides to take actions in that environment, the environment responds by transitions and rewards, and now the agent's goal is to find the policy, the action selection rule that will maximize my total discounted rewards. So now, how do we formalize these types of problems? So one way to formalize them is called Markov decision processes or MDPs for short. So this is the way we would formalize kind of a problem of the setup that I described. And next we will talk about what MDPs are. So to start talking about MDPs, right? We are going to have a tuple of the following. So we're gonna have something called S, something called A, something called T, and something called R. S is going to be the set of states we have in the environment. So for example, here's a discrete environment where I give you three states, S0, S1, and S2. Those are three states. And that, so this is all my state space in this example I am developing. It's only three possible states I could be in. So those states could, for example, be in, in our examples, you know, could be like the position of the end effector. Of course, they will be continuous there. But for now, we're just abstracting away all the complexity to understand the simple cases. And then we're going to build, you know, complexity on top of that. So the first thing we need, right, is this set of states, which we call S. So S is the set of states. Then we have A. A is the possible set of actions. So what actions can you execute in every possible state? So here, I tell you in state S0, you can execute two types of actions. One action, I'm going to call it A1, uh, and another action is I'm going to call it A0. In state S1, you can also execute you know, two actions, either A0 or A1. And in state S2, you can also execute two actions, either A0 or, or, A, or A1. So those are the possible set of actions you can execute in every possible state. T, now, now this got complicated, let's go through that slowly, but T is just a transition model, right? So it's a transition model, which will tell you what is the probability that you will arrive to the next state given you were at a previous state and applied some action. So. T is a map from S cross A, because it needs to take as input your current state and current action. And then it will map to the probability vector over all the possible states. So I am at a state S and, and, and apply an action A. What T will tell me is what's the probability I will go to any of the states that are available in my state space, right? Of course, this is not a scalable definition, but again, we are working in discrete case for now. That is kind of okay. Later on, we can parameterize that, make it a density if we are dealing with, you know, continuous transitions and so on. But for now, discrete, lovely case, what the T will do <clears throat> is it will take a state and an action, and then it will tell you a probability over all the possible successor states you can go to, right? Over all the possible states. So this will be a probability vector over all the possible states, and that probability vector is dictating where I will jump next, uh, given that I was at the state S and I applied an action A. Okay, 
So here we had, you know, our state S1, uh, S0, S1, S2. And here we applied A0, A1, A0, A1, A0, A1. This is my action space. So my state space was S0, S1, S2. My action space was A0, A1 in state S0, A0, A1 in state S1, and A0, A1 in state S2. So my action space is A0, A1. Now, my transition model is going to be depicted by those arrows and numbers on top of them. So what those arrows mean and what do those numbers mean? So if we were at, for example, S0, and we decided to apply an action A1, with a probability 1, I will go to S1. However, if I was at S0 and I decided to apply an action A0, I have a 50-50 chance. So I have a 50 chance to go to S2, 0.5 probability, or 50 chance to stay in S0. So if I apply A0, I can stay in my place uh, uh, with a probability 0.5, or I can go to the state S2 with a probability 0.5. Now, if I was at S1, right, then and I apply an action A0, there are three places I can go next. Either with a probability 0.1, I stay in my place, or with a probability 0.7, I go to S0, or with a probability 0.2, I actually go to S2. Right. So, and of course, you can list them for all of them, right? Like if you go to S2 and you apply an action A1, then with 0.4, you stay, probability you stay in S2, with 0.3, you go to S1, and another 0.3 probability, you might go to S0. Now, where does this come from? Where does this T come from? This T is dictating the dynamics of the environment. So, of course, here's an example of it where I gave you those numbers. I just made them up, you know, but I made sure that they sum to one, right, in every state. So, for example, if you apply an action A0, a 0 0.4 plus 0 0.6 has to sum to 1, right? And if you apply an action A0 in S0, then 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 has to sum to 1. And what about this? 0 0.4 plus 0 0.3 plus 0 0.3, they will also sum to 1. Okay. So, so now, where does this come from? It's just for now, I gave it to you. However, typically, this is a part of the environment which the agent will learn, abide its presence, and it will not know about it, right? But here, we're just, again, building smoothly. Later on, this T will be part of the environment. We don't care what it is, and we're going to try to learn from data directly. Or some other techniques like model-based RL, they try to learn this T and then plan in it, right? But but for now, let's stay with the simplest case possible, right? Where I just also give you this T. So now we know what a Markov decision process is so far, right? So a Markov decision process is made of a state space, so S0, S1, S2, an action space, which is telling me what actions I can apply in every state, a transition model, which is telling me how do I transition given that I'm at the state and that I applied an action. So for example, if I am at state as zero and I decide to apply an action A0, the probability of me staying, this probability vector of me staying in S0 is 0 0.5, going to S2 is 0 0.5 and going to S1 is zero, right? There's no way I can actually go to S1. There's no arrow taking me there, okay? So set of states, set of actions, and then the transition telling me how I go from a state, uh, given a state and an action, how do I go to a successor state, to a new state as prime. Okay. And then, of course, what do we mean by kind of Markovian, right? So what, what does this, why is it called Markov decision pro? Why, what, what is about this Markovian thing, right? The, the whole idea of being Markovian is that the transition model itself, and also the reward function, but for now, the transition model itself will not depend on the history, right? So for me to know ST, I don't need to know all the history. I only need to know where I was previously and what action I took previously. So I only need to know T minus one information to know what happens to ST. I'm not really interested in what happened at T minus two, whether it's the S or the A, T minus three up to S0, A0. So for me to know 
something about t. So for me to know the, the state I will be in in time t, I only need two pieces of information. The one about st minus one, so the previous time step state, and about a t minus one, the previous time step action. And I don't really care about all the history that I would have done before that. So that's why we call it a Markovian. So a Markovian process, it means that your t minus one information is enough to you know, know what will happen at the next time step t. And you don't really care for the path you know, by which you've taken. So for example, if I want to know, if I want to know, you know, like if I am at S0, I want to know where I, I how can I get to S0? I only need the previous time step information and I need I need not to know all the history of me looping you know everywhere inside this okay so Markovian it means that um, all I need to care about for me to know uh, what my state st will be I need to start from I only need information from st minus one and at minus one and not all the history. Now, please notice that you might be a bit confused about the indexing, right? Because notice this small as zero, a zero, this big as zero, a zero, and so on, right? And just please notice that this, uh, this small as zero is just where we are at time step zero, where we are at time step one, where we are at time step two, where we are at time step t. So imagine I start somewhere and I run my policy for t steps. I will jump from here to here to here to there to here to there, depending on what action I apply, you know, depending on the policy, right? Here to there, whatever. And then at time step t, I can ask the question, right? What is st given that I was at the st minus one, at minus one, and all the history? Because it's Markovian, I don't care for all the history. I will only care for st minus one and at minus one, right? So that's why it is a Markovian process. Okay. Now, so so here the small s subscript zero s subscript one means the state at time zero, state at time one. Here, big s zero, big s one, big s two. Uh, those are indicating, you know, all the states that are possible in my state space. Okay. So now we know what s is the possible set of states. We know a is the possible set of actions. T is the transition model that's going to tell me how do I go to the next state given my current state and my current action. And we said that this T is Markovian. It only depends on the previous time step to understand what happens on the next time step and not all the history. And now R, R is a mapping from states cross actions to real numbers. So R, which is the reward function, the reward function will tell me how good my action is uh, uh, when I was at some state and I applied that action. So for example, here, I just give you an example where I tell you if you were at a state S1, right, and you actually took an action A0, right, then you will get, uh, and then you, you transitioned from that to S0, then that's a positive reward of plus five. If you actually are at S0 and then, uh, uh, oh, sorry, you were at S2 and then you decided to take action A1, then, and with this probability 0 0.3, you went to S0, then you will get a reward of negative one. So what is this reward? This reward is a function. It's a mapping from states cross actions to real numbers. You have a state and an action, and then you will have the corresponding real number for that state and the action. And the reward is signifying how well, how good is my uh, action that I have taken in that specific state? That's the reward function. It's how good my action is. So the reward function typically defines the goal behind the reinforcement learning problem. So in my robot example, I would define, for example, my uh, reward as the distance to the door. So the closer I am getting to the door, the more negative distance to the door. So the closer I'm getting to the door, the higher the rewards I'm getting. In this example, this is just an illustration which we made up, right, about what a reward function is. But the reward function is simply a mapping from a state cross action. It will take two things, the state and action, give you a real number on, you know, we call it the reward, how good that state and action, uh, how, how good that action was when applied in that state. Now, so, okay, before, before we talk about the interactions, <clears throat> 
like how we interact with this world. Uh, we just, let's recap. We know what a Markov decision process is by now, which is awesome, right? So it has, it's a system which has a, it's an object, let's say, which has a set of states, S1, S0, S1, S2 in my example here. It has a set of actions. It will tell me how I will go from a place to another place, place to another place, right? That's the action I can apply in inside the the uh, the state. And then there's the transition model, which will tell me uh, how I will go to a new state given I was at the current state and I applied the current action. And we learned what Markovian transition means, that I don't need the history. I just need the first, you know, ST minus one, AT minus one to know ST. And then we also have the reward function, which is just a mapping from states cross actions to real numbers. So that's simply what a Markov decision process is. States, actions you can apply in the state, how your environment will transition uh, given that state and that action, how will it transition, that's T. And the last one is the reward, how well is that action in that state? So it's a map from S plus A to real numbers. Okay. And we illustrated this here, right? So we had S0, S1, S2, the states in every place we could apply an action, A1, A0, A0, A1 in S1, S2, A0, A1. And then we also gave the probabilities of transitioning. So if you were at S0, apply A1, you will come to S2 with the probability one. However, if you were at S0 and you decide to apply an action A0, the transition model will give you a 0.5 chance to go to S0 or a 0.5 chance to go to S2. And then we also just did the reward where the reward was just saying, okay, I will get a plus five if I take this path and I'll get a minus one if I'm taking this path. Now, how would we interact in this MDP? So for me to interact in this MDP, I need an agent. So that agent is the actor. It's the actor which follows an action selection rule or a policy to interact with this environment. So this given, given a state ST in my state space, so given I am at the state ST, given uh, that there are a set of actions I could apply, you know, in that uh, state ST, like in my case, A0, A1, and some reward, which is a real number, <clears throat> the agent implements a policy. So what's this policy? This policy is just the action selection rule of that agent. So this agent will implement an action selection rule, which we call it a policy pi, okay? This is a policy pi. So this policy pi will decide what action I am gonna take given that I am at a certain state. That's why it's a mapping from you know, the state space S to a probability vector over the possible actions you can take. That's what the policy is. So the policy simply, given a state, it will output for you what is you know, the probability of the actions that you can take from that state. And that typically in deep RL, we parameterize by neural network, right? Um, but, but for now, uh, the policy itself, just in your head, is simply an action selection rule, right? It's a rule from which the agent could select actions to act in that environment. Upon choosing the action from the policy, so you will sample the action from that policy pi. Upon choosing the action, then the agent will apply that action in the environment, and then the environment can transition to a new state. Based on that, the agent can again uh, uh, apply, take an action according to the policy, the action selection rule, environment transitions according to the transition model T, you can get a reward depending on your transition, and then the agent repeats, and so forth. So this is how the interaction happens, right? So the way the interaction works in RL is you have that agent and you have this MDP, right? Now what the agent will do is it will decide to take an action according to its policy pi, which is you know like this distribution vector from states to probability of reactions. Then upon taking that action in that state, given, I mean, ST and AT, right? Then the environment will transition according to T, to, uh, to this transition matrix or transition uh, model T into ST plus one. 
up and, and then you get the reward as well, you know, depending on ST and AT. And then upon that, the agent can take another action and this process repeats over and over and over again. Now, there are different types of policies you can define. The policy could actually be dependent only on my current state ST, or you can decide to, you can decide to have a policy that depends on all the history you had so far. Now, there are two types of policies we typically will consider. One is called a deterministic policy, and one is called a stochastic policy. A deterministic policy is simply a deterministic mapping from states to action. So a deterministic policy pi will take a state and then will give you an action corresponding to that state. So here is a table illustrating a deterministic policy. Right, so if you are at state as zero, the policy is saying pick action A1. So if I'm at S0, the policy will say pick for me action A1. If I am at S1, the policy, if I'm at S1, the policy is saying pick for me action A0. Right, so if I'm at S1, the policy will decide to take action A0, to which you can transition to S0, or you might try to stay here in S1, or you might go to S2, because there are three different probabilities here. And if you are at S2, the policy, the deterministic policy, is saying pick for me an action A1. So if you are at S2, the policy is saying pick for me an action A1. Now, upon applying that action, what could happen? Well, you can either with the probability 0 0.4 stay in S2, or with the probability 0 0.3 go to S1, or with the probability 0 0.3 go to S0. This is the transition model, right? Depending on transition model. And if you happen to go to S0, you will get a reward of negative one. Okay, so this is one type of policies which are called a deterministic policy, right? So this is a deterministic policy. It's a direct map from state to action, nothing fancy about it. But there are also other form of policies which we call stochastic policies. So those stochastic policies, they are defining a probability distribution over the action conditioned on the state. So let's give an example about that, right? So this is a table of a stochastic policy. There are two actions. Remember, in every state, I can apply an action A1 or A0, or A1 or A0, or A1 or A0 in every state, state 1, S0, S1, or S2. So this policy is saying, if you are at state S0, okay, you have a probability one third to choose A0, or you have a probability two over three to choose A1. So it's a stochastic, right? Like it's a stochastic vector. This is a stochastic vector over the actions given that I'm at a state as zero. If I was at a state as one, right? I can also choose either A0 or A1. However, the policy is saying with a probability one, you should take A0. And with a probability zero, you should take A1. And if you were at S2, right, if we were at S2, again, we can only take two actions, A0 or A1, A0 or A1. And now here it is saying with a probability 5 over 6, let's take A0, A0, and with a probability 1 over 6, let's take A1. Please notice, you know, that over the rows here, for every state, we're summing to 1, right? Because it should be a probability vector, right? So 1 over 3 plus 2 over 3, 3 over 3 is 1, and 1, 0, it'll be 1, and 6 out of 6 is also 1. Right? So these are two examples, right? So this is an example of a deterministic policy. This is an example of a stochastic policy. The deterministic policy, as you see, is you can think about it as really a special case of the stochastic policy, where with probability one, you're always going to select those actions, right? But here, the ter deterministic policy is saying, if you are at S0, you will always take A1. If you are at S1, you will always take A0. If you are at S2, you will always take A1. This stochastic policy is saying there's a probability. If I'm at S0, there's a probability I will take A0 with 1 over 3, or I will take A1 with 2 over 3. If I'm at S1, there's a probability I will take the A0 1 with, with a probability 1, and there's with a probability 0. So kind of it's deterministic, you know, on S1. And in S2, you know, if I'm at state S2, I can, with a probability 5 over 6, pick action A0, or with a probability 1 over 6, pick action A1. Okay, so two types of policies, deterministic, stochastic. MDP, we know what it is, set of states, set of actions, transition, how I go from state to another state and apply it while applying an action A, a reward telling me how well I do, map from state to action to real numbers. 
Two types of policies we discussed so far, which is a deterministic policy and a stochastic policy. Deterministic policy is just telling me uh, deterministically I will take these actions with probability one. Stochastic policy says I have a probability distribution over A0, A1, uh, depending on which state I'm in. Okay. So now the, how the interaction loop happens, right? So imagine we have the following interaction loop. So imagine you have a policy pi, right? Which is a deterministic policy in this example, right? Because it's a direct mapping from state to action, okay? There's, it's not mapping to you know a, a simplex or a probability vector, it's just direct mapping from state to action. This policy is saying, if I'm at a state as zero, take action A1. If I'm at a state as one, take action A1. If I'm at a state as two, take action A0. So it is saying, right? It is saying, if you are at the state as zero, okay, you are going to apply an action A1. So for sure you will go to S2, right? If you are at S1, right, actually take an action A1, right? So you are here at A1. So you can you can either go back, right? Or you can, you know, maybe go to S2 with a very small chance. And if you were at S2, we're going to actually take an action A2. And that has a 0.4 probability to go to S0 or 0.6 to go back to S2. And where I'm getting, you know, how do I go from a place to another using this transition model T. And my action AT is nothing but the policy. And my reward that I will get is just this reward function based on the state and the action. So for example, if I decide to take from S1 A0 and I end up in S2, I will get a plus five, right? If I was at S2 and I decide to take an action A1, there is a 0.3 chance I will go to S0 and get a minus one. And then this will form a trajectory. So interacting in this way with the eight, with the environment like this over a horizon, over a set of time steps, will you know uh, give you a what we call a trajectory. So that trajectory is simply made of this sequence of state, action, reward, next state, next action, next reward, the next, next state, the next, next action, the next, next reward, and so on. So you start at S0, right? You will take an action depending on the policy, right? As given by the policy. And then you will get a reward for that state and that action depending on your reward function defined by the MDP. And then you will transition to S1, oops, and then you will transition to S1, right, depending on your transition model T. Then when you are at S1, you will again take an action depending on your current policy, and you will get a reward depending on, you know, that state, that action, and your reward function. And then you transition according to transition model to S2, and this process repeats. So now here's a exercise for you to attempt. Imagine my policy, right? Imagine my policy is given like this. So I have a deterministic policy. Y of S0 is A1. So the policy at S0 is A1. The policy at S1 is A1. The policy at S2 is A0. And now imagine that I'm starting in a state S0, right? Now your goal is to tell me, you know, what will happen, right? So if I start at S0, and now I will take the action A0, which is pi of S0, right? So I will take an action A0. Now notice that that action at the first time step, A0, is pi of S0, right? Pi of S0 is A1, right? So from S0, you decide to take the action A1, okay? Where do you go? To S2. And now when you are in S2, what the action will be, it's A0. So when you apply A0, right, you will transition either to S0 or to S2. So now if you have the interaction loop and like this interaction loop, starting from S0 and, and following this deterministic policy, what are the next elements that will happen? So if you just look carefully into that, you are actually... Uh, able, I believe, to actually solve this problem and write your answer in the comments below. It's really not that complicated. Right, so as I was saying, you start from S0 is S0, then you apply A1, then R0, then S1, and so on, right? So this is the interaction loop. What happens? Can you continue this sequence? Okay.
Now, for me to be able, so now we understand an MDP, we understand a policy, we understand how to interact with an MDP. MDP, state action uh, transition model reward, and also a discount factor, but that's later. State action transition and reward, we know the set of states S, the set of actions A, transition model, and the policy, right? Like that, uh, the, uh, sorry, and the reward. And then we said that there's an agent and that agent has a policy. That policy could be deterministic or stochastic. Uh, it will map from states to actions, either in a deterministic way or will give me a probability vector. And then this interaction happens over time. I start at some state, I ask the policy, what's the action? The policy will tell me that's the action, that the model will, I will get a reward, then the model will transition, uh, the environment will transition to the next state and this process repeats, okay? Now, for me to be able to actually learn anything here, I need a criterion which tells me how good is a policy, right? when I executed in a certain environment. So imagine I have a policy, and now my goal is to improve you know, that policy. So the question is, if I can measure how good the quality of that policy is, okay, I am able to maybe improve that policy. So before talking about improvement, let's talk about measures of quantity of that policy, uh, sorry, of quality of that policy. So how good is a specific policy? How do we define that? So there are different ways you can actually define the quality of a policy pie. Uh, I think there are also more than just these ways, but for now, let's just talk about these ways. Um, because I think the others are just simple modifications of those. But there's a finite cost criterion, there's a discounted cost criterion, and then there's an average cost criterion. The finite cost criterion, all it's going to do is that it's going to sum over the time steps from zero to n, all the rewards you have gotten, given that you started in some state and you applied this policy by. The discounted cost criterion is going to go over like a very long horizon, and it's going to be discounting the sum of those rewards by this factor gamma t, and that gamma t is less than one, so this series will not diverge. The average cost criterion is the limit as n goes to infinity of the expectation over your policy of one over n the summation from t equals zero to n minus one of r t. So if you kind of write it out, it will be just the limit as n goes to infinity of one over n, the sum of those rewards. Now, a couple of things that should be clarified here, right? So what is an expectation, first of all? Please notice, right, that the policy can be stochastic and the transition environment can be stochastic, right? So the policy can be stochastic and the transition model can be stochastic. And also the reward can be stochastic. But, but for now, we're not considering it. But for now, we have the transition model to be stochastic and the environment to be stochastic. So now when I am actually evaluating the policy, I will be looking on the expected value of that policy, which is on average how good this policy is doing. So on average, how good is my policy doing? And that's what the expected value is actually measuring, right? So the expected value will simply measure the probability of following that trajectory, you know, multiplied by the total reward that you got in that trajectory. So it will be the expectation, for example, if we talk about the finite cost criterion, it will be the expectation under pi of the summation of the reward that you got uh, uh, you know, for this n steps. Now, what is the expectation? Okay, The expectation of a random variable is going to be the summation of the probability of that random variable multiplied by the function you are interested in. So here we are interested in this total sum of rewards. So the expectation will be the summation over all the possible states, successor states and actions with their probabilities multiplied by this. We are going to take an example on that in a second, but just notice why we have the expectation, right? Because 
we have a, a stochastic policy and a stochastic transition. Now, what is gamma discounting, right? So here's a question, you know, why do we rely on gamma discounting? So gamma discounting, again, this is a parameter gamma, which is less than one. And the gamma discounting is used to do what? To weigh the future? Because the present should be more uncertain that, that, than the future. Do accelerate computation to use less memory or to use less GPU or to use the GPU. What do you think is the answer to that? And the answer to that is to weigh the future because higher gamma give you more importance for the future. So let's look into that and understand this. So let's have a look at this, right? So what is this doing, right? So this is R0, okay, plus gamma R1, plus gamma squared R2, right? And so on. Now imagine gamma was equal to zero. If gamma was equal to zero, this term will be zero, this term will be zero, and so on. Everything else will be zero. So in reality, I'm measuring how good my policy is depending on only my current reward that I am getting. Right? Now imagine gamma was a value which is close to one, right? Yeah. So what is happening? Well, if it's a close to one, so let's say it's like 0.99 or something, right? 0.99. So you're going to get R0 plus 0.99 R1 plus 0.99 squared, right, times R2, oops, R2, and, you know, plus uh, 0.99 cubed R3 to the power 4 R4 up to the power N Rn and so on, right? Now, what is happening here? So it turns out that the quality of the policy not only will depend on your current reward, but also the reward that you will get next and the reward that you will get after that and then the reward that you will get after that and so on. However, they are weighted by you know, decreasing importance, right? So the most important one is kind of the next one, then a little bit after it is also important. And then the one after that on R3 is also important, but less important than this, that less important than that and so on. Right. So what is happening is that I'm actually now uh, giving importance to the future, not only kind of my instantaneous or immediate reward with this gamma, and not only I'm, I'm giving uh, importance to the future, but I'm also discounting that importance. Right, saying that the farther I go in the future, because I'm going gamma power two, gamma power three, right, gamma power n, you know. So, and gamma is less than one. So now as I'm going farther and farther and farther in the future, this importance is decreasing and decreasing and decreasing, okay? And now, of course, in, in the, the finite cost criterion is actually like uh, 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 here, we kind of, we can also discount, some people actually discount that as well. Uh, uh, but, but the gamma should be a number which is less than one. And then it is, uh, it's gonna be giving us, you know, more importance towards the future when we talk about the discounted cost criteria. So effectively, what it is saying is that how you measure how good your policy is, not only depend on your R0, but also on some future you might have. And how important or how much you weigh that future uh, depends on this uh, gamma. Uh, the higher the gamma, the more you look ahead into the future, right? Because uh, you know it's not zero. And the lower the gamma, the less you look ahead into the future because it will get closer as you raise to the power. That will get closer to zero. Okay, so now I will leave you here uh, with an exercise uh, which we are gonna look into next time, right? Uh, uh, together, right? However, maybe you can think about it for the next time. Imagine your N equals to five, right? So N is equal to five. So I'm talking to this environment in a horizon from zero to five, right? So zero, one, two, three, four, five. So I'm talking to it six times, six steps. Now compute the finite cost criterion of some policy pi given in this way. So you have a deterministic policy in this example. At S0, you can apply A1. At S1, you can apply A0. At S2, you can apply also A0. And now if you have a, if we are considering a total number of steps of five, so from zero to five, 
can you compute what jpy will be right for uh, for 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 that for 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 n equals to 5 so imagine we are starting from s1 s0 is s1 so i'm starting here I'm applying this policy pi, which is deterministic policy at state S0, it will take A1. At state A1, it will take A0. At state S2, it will take A0. So S1, it will decide to take A0. Now you want to compute the finite cost criterion of this policy pi for n equals to 5. How would you actually do that? So here's a hint, you know, to think about it. First of all, notice that you need to list all the possible trajectories of this five length, right? Or if this of uh, with n equals to five, and you don't really need to list them all because you need you only need to list those that contribute to the reward because the others which get zero reward, so where there is no uh, like arrow and a number, you're getting zero reward, right? So so those that will get zero reward, they will not contribute anything to the summation, right? So so you just need to list the rewarding trajectories. You need to measure their probabilities, and the probabilities are simple. You just think how you can measure their probabilities, right? We can discuss that next time. And then uh, from that, what you could do is you, when you list them and you measure those probabilities, you can actually just apply this equation in order to see what, you know, the J of pi, this finite cost criterion will be. We will solve this together next time, but uh, give it a thought. Think about it to the next time. If you want, uh, no need to write it down in the comments. If you don't like to, or write it down, we'll be happy to answer, right? So. Let's take a recap before we end this video and next time start from here solving this problem. We talked about what RL is. So we had three machine learning directions. Supervised learning gives you data. Unsupervised learning, more data. Reinforcement learning, you need to learn by interacting with an environment. We talked about what a state is, what an action is. We talked about what an MDP is, a state space, an action space, a transition model, a reward function. And then we said for agents to interact with the MDPs, we need a policy that defines what action I take given I'm at a state. So it maps from states to actions. We talked about two types of policies, right? We talked about a stochastic policy and a deterministic policy. Deterministic policy is like this one here. Stochastic policy is that which will give you this probability factor. And then we also talked about what Markovian transition means, right? Then we talked about, for me to improve my policy, I need a way to quantify how good my policy is. And then we talked about three ways to quantify it. A finite cost criterion, a discounted cost criterion, and an average cost criterion. We talked about what gamma is, it's a discount factor, and we said that it will weigh the future. Then we ended with this exercise. So please feel free to do this exercise and uh, write us in the comment or join us next time where we're going to solve this together and continue from there. So I hope you're really liking those videos. If you are really liking this video, sharing it and subscribing will be very, very, very useful for us. So please do that. I will see you next time where we will continue from here.